Welcome to Q&A with the doctor and daughter. I'm Roz and this is my mom, Dr. Andrea Roberson. Um, our office website is ocfamilydoctor.com and my nutrition website is realfoodfamily.com. Don't forget to send us your questions if you would like to have us answer them here on the show. Our first question, what do we need to know about pre-diabetes? Say my numbers come up 109 for a long time. Not diabetes, but abnormal. Okay, so um, so what does a diabetic patient or pre-diabetic patient look like coming into the office? Look like meaning on paper. Right, their sugars are above 99, and um, usually we do a glucose tolerance test then to see two things. One is their response to sugar, see if it really goes up, but also to see their response in insulin to the sugar. So we give them the sugar, and if we see the insulin fly up out of the normal range, then we know that they're having diabetic metabolism. Well, from my perspective with nutritional therapy is I'm assessing symptoms more. So usually I'm going to find someone who has serious adrenal fatigue and blood sugar regulation problems. So there's going to be a lot of symptoms related to, um, you know, to, to blood sugar handling and to their adrenal glands and maybe symptoms of hyperadrenalism or hypoadrenalism. Okay, so what I explain to people is that you're supposed to have a steady normal blood sugar in your body. Your body kind of has its normal rate that it wants to be at. When you eat or anything that increases the glucose in your blood, the glucose goes up and so your body, your pancreas, produces insulin to get the glucose to come back to normal. And then when you're hungry or if you produce enough insulin or for whatever reason it goes down below the normal level, then your body produces glucagon to get it to come back up. Okay, well what we do in typical American culture is we eat so much sugar, or we have a lot of stress, or we do things that cause our blood sugar to go way up, and our pancreas rushes to produce a lot of insulin um, to bring it back down. And then the liver produces, you know, and then, and then that, that blood sugar drops and the liver's producing glucagon to get it to come back up. And then what happens over time is the little pancreas and the liver get tired and so the adrenal glands and the cells become less responsive to the insulin right. or if you're overweight you have too many cells and that amount of insulin can't um, treat that and when you're saying the blood sugars level insulin takes blood sugar out of the bloodstream and puts it into the cells where it needs to be used and the extra is what's floating around in the bloodstream and so your body decides to store that as fat Right. So, well, and so that's definitely why um, I don't like to say that obesity is a risk factor for diabetes. I think it can be, but often obesity is a symptom of diabetes okay. or blood sugar yeah. handling problems. Um, so anyway, so when we have someone with what we would consider pre-diabetes, that's an excellent case for nutritional therapy. Yeah. Because what we're going to do is we're going to work first. on diet first. Um, and then we're going to be working on getting those organs, the pancreas, the liver, the adrenal glands healthy again. And then um, we're going to be, you know, hopefully this diet and the natural therapies will help the cells heal themselves and respond so that they'll respond better to insulin and we'll be able to normalize everything. The problem is when we, all those cells basically stop responding to insulin and we have kind of what used to be considered an autoimmune situation. But basically you've... It's become more of a medical issue at that point. I think the autoimmune part of it is the predisposition to it, or the thought of that. I, I still, I think it's probably not autoimmune. It's probably genetics, and it, I always tell patients that the gene is probably there, and whether you turn it on or not, you have the choice. So, probably have a genetic predisposition to it, because not everybody that weighs 300 pounds has diabetes, and not... Everyone that right. weighs 110 doesn't have diabetes type right. 2. So, so, right, right, absolutely. Because obviously there's lots of people out there who are eating horribly and they're eating themselves into what you would assume would be a horrible blood sugar and diabetes future. And Some of them don't. They don't. So, there have so what do we need to know about prediabetes? Catch it before it's too late. Well, the thing is, once you... It, I tell people once I know that they have this tendency, they probably are genetically 
have the gene, then they have the responsibility to control it. Yeah. Um, and there's lots that can be done. Absolutely. So I think that sums it up that if you're pre-diabetic, come see me. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, but yeah, I like that you control said. Control the gene. I like that you said you have the responsibility to take care of it. Um, because, you know, we have kind of, we, there aren't, you know, magic pills. It takes work because you, you, a lot of people did a lot of work to get themselves into this situation. So it's going to take the work to get out of it too. Well, and you know when you're young and thin that this whole mechanism of the response of the sugar, you might still be thin, but you might not have a good diet, and you're going to experience hypoglycemia because yeah. you're pouring out that insulin. And having the drops. Right. And usually people think I'm, hy I'm hypoglycemic. Usually people who are hypoglycemic are actually hypo and hyper. They have spikes. Yeah, probably. Um, but they notice because when you're hyperglycemic, that's that adrenaline high kind of feel for the most part. Um, so most people are noticing their crashes. They're noticing the hypoglycemia, so they're considering themselves hypoglycemic, where it's really, those people are usually having those Not regular. Spikes. Yeah, it's unregulated. It's, those are, that, that's what I would consider pre-diabetes, or you know, we need to tackle those blood sugar issues right away. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Next is about coconut oil. Oh um, yeah, the somebody benefits. asked me that the other day. Coconut yeah. oil was considered a saturated fat that needs to be avoided and it's bad for your heart. Um, and, and I completely think the opposite. Coconut oil is a traditional fat that has been used for many, many years by many, many cultures. And I highly suggest it. It's full of really good essential fatty acids, which are good for your heart. Um, no scientific literature shows that it causes um, heart disease in any way. It, at least it's neutral. There's nothing that shows. But the new stuff is saying that brain disease is needed. And you're the one that t explained that about the fat that's needed in the brain. Well, well uh, one thing talking about diabetes is that coconut oil is really great. It can contribute to stabilizing your adrenal glands. And, and all good fats are really good for stabilizing blood sugar because you're going to get your energy from the fat instead of the sugar. Um, but uh, so... One thing we've talked about is Alzheimer's, and there's a lot of interesting um, clinical research, and um, and th there's some research beginning to show how coconut oil um, is helping with Alzheimer's patients, which is really cool. I made I um, I posted a blog post about Alzheimer's and the coconut oil relation. So maybe if you're interested, you want to look that up In on realfoodfamily oh. on realfoodfamily.com. Um, but the reason it's such a good fat, do you know why it's such a good fat? Why would it be a good fat to cook with? I don't cook. <laughs> so it's a good fat to cook with because it's really stable. It has a high smoke point. And see, most vegetable oils and cheap fats that we're using to cook with and, and things, they're very unstable. And so when you add any heat to them, it, it, it no. changes the fat molecules and now you have an adulterated fat. You have a, a fat that's gone rancid or has oxidized and that is what we know causes inflammation. Okay. Oxida oxidization or oxidizing of these fat molecules. So that's why I promote traditional fats um, that have these high smoke points and they're safe and they're stable when cooked at high heats. It's also fantastic raw. You can eat raw coconut oil. I actually use coconut oil as a moisturizer, just plain. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I think it's really good all around, and just we're not we're not going to say here if it cures anything or anything like that. But definitely, no. if you're um, seemingly from what we've read and been seeing, if you're dealing with dementia, Alzheimer's, um, consider maybe adding coconut oil to your diet, and you can well, do that. But, but everybody needs to add a little more fat to their diet. Yeah. So. That, because absolutely. we're so terrified of fat that, and, and if you take the taste out of food, you either have to put it back with sugar, right, or with fat. And that's what we did in the low-fat craze of the last yeah. fifty years. We took all of the fat out and we just added a bunch of sugar, carbohydrates, carbohydrates to make it taste better. So, so yeah, it's easy and it's easy. I've had I, eggs taste really good in coconut oil. Actually, I, I like butter too, but um, eggs. I've made um, just. Popcorn on the stove, just with popcorn kernels with coconut oil. Oh, that's good. You can add coconut oil to smoothies, like 
um, you know, yogurt, fruit and yogurt smoothies, something like that. Um, I know people that will like pour it on oatmeal or something like that. So go go ahead and get yourself some extra virgin some good fat. coconut oil. Trader Joe's just started selling a virgin coconut oil at a great price. So good. I don't know if I'll get in trouble for plugging Trader Joe's, but okay, next. It's our own station. <laughs>